So today is um, a lot of sitting and listening. We do a little bit of group activity and everything as well, but it's also a chance for you to make the most of it. Pick the brains of the people that are coming. Um, most all of the presenters are registered nurses with um, experience in the space that they're talking to you about, if not also in um, general practice as well. So um, we, we can put up on the board any questions um, that we have that maybe we can't answer. And then hopefully as the speakers come in over the next couple of days, all of your questions and things will be answered. That's okay, just sign in here. Um, so it's sort of meant to be interactive, get to talk to each other, and you'll probably find that you've all had similar issues about settling in or, you know, oh, this is new and it's so different to what I've done before, or, hey, this is fantastic. And I think it's a really good move in moving into general practice, into that primary care space. I think this is our merging or emerging sort of um, career pathway for nurses. It's a great area. It's very diverse as well um, so no day would be the same and you know you'd get to deal with a whole lot of different things but the knowledge you need to know you've probably discovered is huge as well as dealing with doctors and patients coming in and every everything else as well so today the next couple of days is more of an overview of a lot of the things that happen in general practice not every single thing and hopefully we'll be giving you enough resources that you can go oh that's in that book I'll just click on that link or oh, that's right I should go here for that so it's not necessarily about having to know everything but just knowing where you can go um, to get sort of m further information or to learn something and also ap um, getting a bit more of an understanding around APNA because they're your sort of professional body your support group that um, they have um, people there that can help you with, with issues um, and they run online courses, lots of education as well, as well as these sort of foundation courses. So um, I'm Kate, as Jess said, I'm a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse for a long time. I'm also a nurse immuniser, which is great. I'm very passionate about it. And uh, I'm now working in the field of cancer screening. So we're promoting cervical, breast and bowel. So I'll be trying to slip those things in uh, whenever I can. So you can tell me to be quiet if you like. But I also thought just for fun today, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to do your own bowel screen, but if you wanted to have a look at the kit that gets sent out to patients, because that's the one thing that we don't actually see because it goes straight to the patient. But that's aside from the point. Uh, just to get started, we always start with um, the primary health care system in Australia um, and um, all the primary health care and, um, prim and that how the health care system works. Sometimes, um, especially if we've, we've come through university and we've worked in hospitals, we don't actually think about how all the funding and things happen. We go to the treatment room and there's a dressing pack, pull it out and go. Although I think we're more aware of the cost of things. But this will just explain some of the differences and, um, so, and it sort of will help explain why general practice or primary yeah. care settings can sometimes um, sort of run a little bit differently because each general practice is its own business in its own entity in itself as opposed to a big public hospital that's got campuses and everything sort of all under the one system. So um, it's really um, in, an interesting sort of thing to sort of sort out. Some of you might already have that and I'm sorry if this might end up boring you. So this is our learning objectives for today. These are all in your handouts as well. So um, any um, links and everything will be there uh, in, in those pages and most of the slides will be in order. Some of the speakers may have made a couple of changes or some additions as well, but generally everything's there with all the resources available. So we talk about health. So what is health? So health is sort of not just the absence of illness, um, which is often how we um, do define it. Um, it's a sense of well-being felt by individuals relative to their circumstances. So we might look at somebody and think they don't feel necessarily, they don't look particularly healthy, but to them they might be at the best health they can be. But this is where all of this is quite sort of subjective often, but sometimes there are measurements that tell us that maybe somebody isn't healthy as well. So it can be physical, psychological and social wellness as interpreted by the individual. But we also must remember that there's cultural differences in our beliefs around what is health and what, what isn't health. Uh, or what is illness. Um, we've been doing work um, with the Italian community around cervical screening and they don't believe in screening. Why would you tempt fate and look for it? Uh, where, as opposed to some of the Arabic communities we're um, working with, um, once we've educated them that we've got these screening programs, think it's fantastic. 
So, you know, so it's also understanding when you're working with different people that their beliefs behind uh, what is health or what they can do to prevent illness will be very different to maybe what we believe as well. Um, we believe in person-centred care and um, a holistic approach to reach the best outcomes for that patient. And um, who um, in 1978, I think, um, hi, come on in, that's okay. There's a couple of seats here in the front row and just over there, so hi. So we've just started with the first session. That's right there. Okay. Um, so they developed the Alma Arda in 1978 and then the Ottawa Charter in 1980. And they were sort of the first sort of things looking at primary health care. So we haven't always had primary health care. It hasn't always been part of our health system. Often we worked on, you get sick, you, you go to the hospital, you go to the doctor, uh, whatever. You know, we didn't sort of really have a concept of what primary health care was. So primary health care encompasses uh, all things regarding health. So we're looking at prevention right through to sort of end of life care. So we, we can do the whole gamut all in primary health care. Whereas often with a sickness model, it's sort of about you get sick, you go to the doctor, they'll give you something. And if not, you die. You know, that's very basic um, modelling of it. But uh, they started to think about it only in the late 70s that primary health care could be its own entity. It had always existed, but they were finally sort of putting it into its own sort of specialty area as well. So they looked at public health, health promotion and illness prevention and social determinants. Social determinants of health, you might have heard previously in other roles before. So of course we have different models of health. Um, a lot of us that have sort of been in hospitals, maybe some people are hospital trained, um, universities, we were very good at the, um, the biomedical model of health, which um, talks about, you know, it's really looking at GP specialists, uh, pharmacists, pathologists, sort of all that sort of specialty. And they might say to you that heart disease is caused by hypertension, family history and a build-up of arterial plaque, which is true. That does cause heart disease. And that's what all those health professionals in the medical world will tell you and believe, and that, that is true. But then we also have behavioural issues, people as well, or issues. So we've got psychologists, diabetes educators, exercise physiologists, and they say that heart disease is caused by smoking, physical inactivity, excess alcohol, and a high fat diet. And that's true too, because they will all lead to all of those other things up the top there, as opposed to maybe not family history. And then we've got sociological. So the epidemiologists, social workers will say it's caused by stress, poverty, unemployment and social isolation. And they do really have a big impact on people's health as well. So even though they all have, say, there's different things that cause heart disease, they're all correct, but they're all coming at it from a different way. So general practice actually pulls all of this together and is the central point for all of those different models and beliefs around uh, health and what causes illness as well. So there are other others out there, it's not just sort of a tri model. Um, so there's spiritual, indigenous communities often believe different things as well, health education and biological issues as well, which we're understanding more and more about that. So a lot of these things we'll look at today and some of these things around heart disease we can change and there's some things we can't, but we can be more aware of them as well. So when it comes to health in Australia, we're very um, fortunate in Australia in that we have um, universal health care, in that we have a funded health care system. Uh, I know it all, it does come from our taxes, but anybody can access health care uh, and um, be treated. And we're very fortunate in that our specialists or health professionals that work in our private system are also the same ones that work in our public system. So there's often not a lot of disparity between the level of care. It's just sometimes around the time that we may have to wait, depending on urgency of care as well. So the, we have, it becomes tricky when we're looking at healthcare because we have that sort of tri-level of government and a lot of things are distinct and a lot of things overlap. So the Commonwealth um, fund primary healthcare so, and general practice mainly. So Medicare funds general practice. So, um, and there's other payments outside of uh, Medicare item numbers as well, but that, that will all be com generally all Commonwealth uh, funding. So all from the Commonwealth government. Um, they also fund a lot of our pharmaceuticals through the PBS. 
So a lot of our medications that we do get, or most of them, are subsidised by the government as well. So we're not actually really paying full price. Often you see in the paper people putting in to have, you know, this medication that they need, could it go onto the pharmaceutical list? Because it's so expensive that for them to um, pay for that, it's very expensive. Some aged care, although more aged care does come through Commonwealth funding now, you might all be aware of the My Aged Care website or My Aged Care program. Um, so a lot of the aged care that you might be organising goes through that Commonwealth portal. So a lot of that funding now sits quite centrally, although not all of it as yet. Um, and then sometimes they'll fund grants and territories to work on different projects as well. Then we have our states and territories. So the states control the hospitals. So all of our public hospitals are state run, but it is run with Commonwealth funding, but it's considered state funding because the Commonwealth give it to the state. So then it's up to the state to decide how that's distributed among its hospitals as well. So the hospitals are accountable back to the Department of Health for that state as well. They also fund community health. Um, if you've worked in other states, you'll notice that community health runs very differently in each state as well. Um, so they provide different services. Um, in Victoria, we also have primary care partnerships, which are funded by the state government. And they're organisations that are set up to assist with um, a client being able to move through the healthcare system seamlessly. Not the client doesn't necessarily need to know all the ins and outs of what's Commonwealth, what's not as well. Um, the states also control the immunisation. Public health units, which are more, um, we don't really call them public health units here, that's sort of a um, broader field in Australia. Also some aged care as well, but more of that has gone to the Commonwealth. Then we also have local government, which do have some aged care uh, or some health component as well. Um, and since aged care is moving more and more to the national scheme, there's less and less there, but they work a lot in local environmental health. So that, that's really their big role. And that's particularly important when we're looking at health promotion for our community and society as well. And of course, uh, most of, uh, a lot of the immunisation in Victoria is run out of our local government. So the immunisation section, which is state funded, then fund the councils as part of their um, health services to, to run immunisation sessions. So Victoria is quite unique like that, where the one, one, one or two states only have such a big mater, um, immunisation uh, program that is run out of council. So a lot of other states, uh, immunisation is really solely in the, the realm of general practice, except most every state does offer it in schools for secondary school program. So um, that's where we are quite unique as well. So that's sort of how it all sits and overlaps as well there. So, so when we're looking at health and that in, in Australia and our life expectancy, so we're pretty lucky now. Men can expect to live uh, to 80.4 years and women can expect to live to 84.5, although I think that might have been readjusted just lately up to 84.7. I went to a breakfast and Julia Gillard presented and she said like years ago, um, like in say 1910, uh, the expected life expectancy of a man was around about 42, 52, sorry, and the expectancy of a woman was um, about 58 years. So that's very, very young, very young, very young indeed. Um, and when you think about like um, the aged pension, people are saying, oh, they keep moving up the age that we can retire and get the aged pension. It was set at a stage when a lot of people didn't get to have the pension. So we're sort of thinking now, if you think about how long we're living, um, what was considered old age then is now prime of your life here now in Australia as well. So contributing factors to this, are our childhood vaccination program, Australia's got one of the most comprehensive programs in the world. Um, our influenza vaccination that we've brought in for at-risk groups um, has really made a big difference there. Improvements in management of heart disease and stroke. And you know the single most biggest thing that's had the biggest impact on heart disease has been medications. So for all the surgery and everything that we do, it's that antihypertensive drug and that foxglove when we got digitalis all those years ago worked out to slow down heart rates and you know even out heart rates, have, that has the biggest impact on um, controlling heart disease. A bigger impact is if we can prevent it. So by controlling smoking, which is up there as well, decreased smoking rates, and activity in our food intake. 
but um, the most in, um, improvements they get is if they can, they seem to be able to get a better medication, not that we want to focus on that, but a lot of the money and that that goes into the treatment of heart disease is in surgery, and that sort of doesn't have as big a bang for buck as well. Um, but it is really important. Um, the, I sort of also believe that maybe our um, antenatal care, because um, mothers coming into pregnancy are in a better physical state, well nourished, um, and then have, good, have access to um, good antenatal care as well, where we're giving birth to babies that start out life pretty healthy to start with as well. Plus the fact that we're immunising mothers during pregnancy as well. But we do have areas of disadvantage, and one of these big areas is our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And it's shameful um, if you look at the Indigenous life expectancy there. You know, we're looking at more than a decade difference between men and women. And um, that, that's, um, you know, it is, as I said, quite shameful. Um, so they do have a lower, often have an experience a lower quality of life, have more disability and poorer health than non-Indigenous Australians. Um, and this, this comes down to a lot of it to do with the social determinants of health. So a lot of them are in overcrowded households, lower educational attainment, higher rates of unemployment and lower incomes than other Australians. And this is just uh, a, a, over on a whole. And if we look at all um, people living in lower socioeconomic circumstances, that is, is these are often the instances that, that exist there. So it's um, not just uh, individual to Aboriginal Australians, but there's more, more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders do sit in that group. Um, and we really need to look at ways to, you know, move forward. We've got a lot more Aboriginal children completing school and university. So we're hoping in the decades to follow, um, we, we will be seeing um, changes to that. Um, so uh, they also have a high, an increased incidence of lifestyle risk factors as well there. Um, and we have a Closing the Gap initiative, which is a health initiative funded by the Commonwealth to close that gap. And the gap they're talking about is the gap in life expectancy. But a lot of Aboriginal people find there's a lot of gaps in their life, that there really is um, a space that we really um, should be closing as well. Um, so there we go. Um, there's other disadvantaged groups there. Can anyone else think of any other groups that might fit into there? So we have people living with mental illness, people with disabilities, remote communities, uh, people reliant on benefits and social services, homeliness, homelessness, homelessness, did I say that correctly, aged and the cold community as well. Um, I think maybe also with um, diabetics as well. Type 1 diabetics, there's a real issue around that age group of around the early, late teens to early 20s when they're getting into the workforce. They can't afford their medications, their tests, because they cost them a fortune and they lose their Medicare card, so mm. their healthcare card as soon as they go into the workforce and it costs them a fortune and then they can't they yep. have that cost to live and look after themselves. Yep, that's so a really that's good one to think about. As well. Yep. And you know, they're often they're, they're not sort of showcased at all because no. it's sort of, it's not a sexy disease or, you know, yeah. And it's not something you've chosen to have. No. It's an autoimmune disease that yeah. you're yeah. down to get if you yeah. get it. And I guess other autoimmune disease groups possibly may be the same, but you're right, the equipment needed. And I'm and I never understand why it's not subsidised, like, you know. They're learning to control their money, like they're teens, they want to have fun, they want to live, but then they're forced to put all their money into their healthcare and they don't understand yeah. that they need to, why yeah. they need to, fully. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what, no one's ever identified that before and I Most totally agree with you. So. Yeah. No, I think that that's great and it, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, I also think of maybe the LGBTI community as well um, can sometimes live with um, a lot of, uh, you know, issues as well that they're dealing with and, minor and can be a minority in areas and maybe not as well accepted. Although we, we seem to be moving forward with that here in Australia, um, but there's still a lot of young people that are, um, uh, or any, anybody that identifies as um, LBGT, LBGTI, um, uh, you know, can still have uh, issues and they're, sometimes their health needs are, are quite different as well. Just looking at our immunisation program, there's a couple of extra vaccines that have been put on the schedule as well um, because um, they're at risk. 
Um, I think one of our biggest ones that's becoming more apparent, which you might have seen if you'd walked from the station today, is homelessness. Um, just, and it's quite visible now, it's not hidden. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's always been around. Um, it's just now it's sort of, it's out there. Uh, and um, it's, it is very difficult. And that often relates to our mental health system as well, not supporting people uh, as well there. I, I probably in remote communities, I'd also suggest um, rural. Yes. And rural because then your, your level of obesity in the rural areas is quite different as well. Because people have to drive <coughs> places. And yeah. Places, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, and particularly in Victoria, we probably don't have many what we would call remote areas, but we do have outer rural and rural, and and that's true. Um, my, as I said earlier, we're um, auctioning our house tomorrow, and we're moving, but we're not moving out of the metro area because we're thinking mm, we're getting to that age now where we might need to access hospital services, and you know, and my I always remember my mum saying they had friends that moved up to the river to Yarrawonga. And then, you know, they became unwell, developed chronic illnesses, and a lot of the care comes out of Albury. You know, it's not, not handy. So um, it, I always just remember that, that little tidbit there. But that shouldn't be the case. We should, everybody should have equal access. But in the metropolitan areas, we are looking at people having better access to health care as well. Yep. Regular visas don't access, have yep. any access to, you know, services under Medicare. Yep. They and they have limited uh, access to other social services and income. So, yeah, they are um, a, a, a risk, a high risk group for, for, you know, poorer outcomes as well. Yeah. Yep, that's when true. They come and they have a screening, then they're like, okay, we've got these these dates in the last month, we didn't know that. And then they're like, well, how do we afford to keep coming to see the doctor? Yeah, that's right. And I think they're also finding that a lot of them let their insurance lapse because it becomes expensive. And then they have a baby and it becomes more expensive. I know um, immunisation have looked at that. So everybody, regardless of their Medicare status, are covered for immunisations. But that doesn't help if they had diabetes or... Um, something else as well yeah so it's important to be aware that you'll have all these different groups coming or hopefully they're coming to the general practice but just to, to be mindful that there's different um, issues I also sometimes think of um, adolescents sometimes um, might not not so much be disadvantaged but less likely to want to engage with the healthcare system at a stage of their life that maybe they they need to um, I always talk to adolescents when I, um, I used to do some sex ed in the schools around asking um, the doctor, because they might have, we do not bulk bill, you know, or, but ask the doctor, because it's up to them to decide on the billing. Because if you ask the reception staff, they'll say, oh no, we're not a bulk billing clinic. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I say to them, just chat to the doctor and say, look, mum would normally pay. I don't want mum to know what I'm here about, you know, um, and they, they're um, entitled to that confidentiality, particularly if they're older adolescents. Um, and to discuss that with the doctor. So that, you know, maybe arrangements can be made as well. Okay, um, so we've talked about that. I was gonna, we had, I had an activity there, but I think we've sort of had a good discussion around that. So I'll keep moving along. So when we look at the health iceberg, has anyone seen this before? This is sort of a health promotion uh, thing that we talk about that we're, we, we're all like icebergs really in that we have the presenting illness or condition which, uh, may, which may be obvious. So that's sort of the top, top of the iceberg or the tip of the iceberg as they say. Then sitting just underneath there is contributing factors. What's contributed to that illness? Um, you know, it might be a family history or a genetic predisposition, but it might be that we've been inactive, eaten a lot of McDonald's, smoked a few cigarettes, had too much alcohol or not, may or may not be. And then sitting under that is social determinants. So, as, um, so when we talk about the social determinants, it's what, what society are we living in or what area are we living in? What sort of life are we living that contributes to our health? As you heard me talk about with our Aboriginal population, often they're living in overcrowded conditions, uh, uh, not as a higher attainment of education, less chance of employment. So they're all what we call social determinants. So, um, uh, all of those things that we do, like living in, um, you know, 
clean environment, um, you know, not, not overcrowded because, you know, diseases are easily shared. If we're going out to work each day, you know, often if you've got a good education, you'll get a good job like all of us here have um, uh, jobs and, you know, been to university and, and studied. So already we're sort of up on the rungs with our social determinants. And even um, we've got a, a higher chance of um, gaining employment and ongoing employment, but even we can make more informed decisions. We can hear information or look at information and, and decipher whether we, we believe that to be true or not, rather than, um, you know, I know some people I know uh, rely on the Herald Sun for a lot of their health information, which generally speaking, it's pretty, can be pretty upfront and honest, but, you know, uh, we need people to maybe make other decisions as well around that. And then it can depend, like you said, around rural communities, just, just purely on the fact of your postcode can make a big difference as well. There's a, system, a computer system in England that you can put your postcode in and it can tell you your expected life expectancy based on your postcode and how long you've lived there. Uh, I don't know how accurate it is. It's got some data behind it, but like that's um, quite frightening really, isn't it? So, um, so what I might get you to do in pairs or threes, um, that does it, I'm not really fussed about the size of the groups, but if you can identify, uh, well, we've already identified, I think, a lot of the disadvantaged groups, but maybe you want to pick some of the ones we've talked about, or if you can think of another, and just discuss what do you think the associated social determinants and contributing factors might be for those couple of disadvantaged groups there. Um, and then we'll talk about person-centred health promotion strategies. So if you can just have a quick discussion around two disadvantaged groups, um, so what would be the associated social determinants? What, what do you think they might be? And I always like this discussion because people come in with other things as well that we might not have thought of. And um, what could be the contributing factors as well? So the social determinants are sort of based on their social life and their living. And then the contributing factors of maybe what actions or non-actions have they taken that um, might contribute to, to them becoming unwell, particularly with a focus maybe on chronic disease. So just have a little chat. Okay, everyone. It's so good to hear you're all chatting and getting to know each other. I'll get you to sign on. I'll get you to sign on. There. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just so we don't forget. Okay. Did, who, which disadvantaged groups did um, you guys use? utilise? Um, we spoke about the homeless, yep. uh, just multicultural because from we're both from a rural area, so yep. <laughs> sorry. <Yeah>. No, no. <laughs> more about that and yeah. what was around and what we find. Yep. Yeah. So, That's good. And just the drug and alcohol problem and yeah. why they're now becoming homeless and yeah. how accessible it is and also the barrier between law enforcement and these people. It's, they know it's there, but it's like part of them turned a blind eye. Yeah. I'd like to know why we can't yep. do a little bit more. A little bit more, yep. Mm. Yep. And so I have only got the experience of um, in the city homelessness and I know where I, the suburb I live in, we know where there's a couple of people that sleep rough um, and people drop off bits and pieces for them. I know one guy's got really quite severe mental health issues because yeah. he's, he's actually got money and he owns a unit but somebody, you know, when they came around to do the LED lights, change the light globes, he felt that they put a bug in there. And so they were watching him. So he just doesn't stay in his house. So I don't know how you solve that either. Yeah. But, um, but rural, you'd say that homelessness is... It's becoming more of becoming an issue. More of an because issue. of the drug and alcohol problem as well. Yeah, That's yeah. And I guess drug and alcohol services may not be as available out there, would you say, as yeah, well? Yeah, not as available. And yeah. They're stretched. Yeah. All the funding that they have. And yeah. yeah. And I know community health services, when they report back, that's one of their busiest areas and they are at yeah. capacity. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's interesting. And I think homelessness is a really big, and it's a big social issue, political and social, and I'm not sure what the answers are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. It's sad to see them come in. Yeah. 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 And there's some good services. There's one guy that bought a washing machine and put it in a van and he drives around and washes yeah. clothes. Like some, there are some good people out there, yeah. um, but that still doesn't solve yeah. the homelessness. But I think drugs um, definitely have be had a big part to play 
in that, and that's that's not a class. That's not doesn't matter how educated you are or not. It, drugs sort of get get to everybody, and you know they destroy lives. That addiction. So yes, you guys here. I'm more pointed out the drug and alcohol as well. Mm -hmm. So down my way, we're really limited for resources. Right. And like, um, um, I was going to say, what I find down on the islands, like once someone gets in a rut with drug and alcohol addiction, once they're in the rut, it's really hard to get out. Mm. Yes. There's, there's no services. There's, you know, I think one or two ladies with the community health that talk to um, those that need it, but and that's just so stretched. Yeah. Like one patient was telling me, like the AA meetings, there's one down our way one night a week, and in Melbourne they're in like every town. Yeah. Like, you know, every day, and like when it is, you can't get to it. Like it's yeah. just, it's really mm. stretching it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, and the family influences like that's what. Yes. Like, um, especially with health, like if you, um, like if it was like addicted parents yep. or whatever, your image of health is different. Is warped and, you know, it's yep. not as and maybe you don't have that expectation. Yeah. Like I expect to have good health, and I get I'd get disappointed when they say we can't fix that. What do you mean? You yeah. know. So yeah, you're right. It sets the sort of sets a, a standard or puts yeah. the bar or some people just feel they you know they're so downtrodden sometimes they feel like they don't don't deserve yeah, it the motivation is just yeah. yeah yeah that's good down in the back row there um, we chose the aboriginal uh, group yes some of, um, some of us well, one of us in an area that's uh, most prevalent with it um, and there was a lot of social uh, determinants and contributing factors so that at overcrowded house um, houses where they would be relatively clean but uh, would have lots of dogs and leave their dogs with other dogs and mm, yep lies fleas, fleas yep uh, then you have bed bugs in your in your beds and things like that uh, people are afraid to go to the hospital or don't want to go to the hospital possibly associated with death, possibly uh, socially, like the cultural want to be with family, and yep. family gets pushed aside in hospital. Um, and also the trauma of they've had hist historically um, babies were removed from mothers, Aboriginal mothers had, you know, um, so hospitals weren't always seen as a, a place of healing yeah. as well, it was trauma. Mm. And then the overcrowded houses, Certain people could be like smoking inside or on yep. drugs and things, and uh, with multiple families or extended families in one house. Yep. All those issues kind of uh, compound kids getting asthma because of all the smoke. And dust, and yeah, that's right. I know when we were doing pandemic planning years ago, um, we, you know, when they were saying that they would close schools, they'd keep kids at home because they assume. Well, the majority of kids these days have a, a, their own bedroom, so they're in their own little isolation unit so that they're not as likely to pass it on. And when you look at sort of communities like that or, you know, it's, um, or people living in crowded conditions, that, that's a risk. Yeah, they'd be better off at, at school. So, yeah, that's um, really well thought out. Mm, that's good. Um, we did um, the AIDS. Um, yes. And we, mostly it was about uh, housing and um, income resources. Mm -hmm. So uh, how they can afford their medication or how to access services or even if they've got enough money for food um, and uh, yeah, the other environment. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a really, it's sometimes a little bit hidden like because they're, they're not working and they're retired and um, I know my parents were discussing the other day that they can't afford for both of them to go into aged care if ever it gets to that point. So, you know, it's one or the other. <laughs> my mum was being quite funny about it. I hope she was joking. But, um, yeah, and, and that's a really real um, thing. Um, I talk to people that um, they go to um, the, the local um, swimming pool to do 
hydrotherapy and that and they'll, have, they'll go every day so they can have a shower there so then they're not paying for their water mm. and, you know and I'm thinking gosh that must be so stressful to think mm. that much and that's people that are aged but not unwell mm. so yeah that's a really good have a cash flow yeah they, and then the, the choice is to leave their home or their family home to access services mm. yeah. yeah and I think it's becoming more of an issue because we're such an aging population as well Yes, yeah, so that's a good one. Miss Belinda, your team? Well, actually, we talk about aged care too, yep. but we didn't look on their sheet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, different angle. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Different angles well, are good. Well, we were talking about technology mm -hmm. and how that's changed everything and it makes it particularly difficult for the aged mm -hmm. because they do not know even how to use a mobile phone, mm -hmm. let alone get onto the My Aged Care website Yes. or create a My Health Record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, My Gov account. I've got a degree and I can't do that. <laughs> I don't think anybody can. Everyone tells me that they fight with their My Gov account. Yeah. All my patients. Yeah, and the if you speak another language, please click here. Is on page two. Oh, mm. really? It might have changed it now because I rang and complained about it, <laughs> not because of just for me. But you know, if you were if you spoke another language, yeah, yeah, all these resources, but you had to get to page two to see where to click. Yeah. Mm. That um, doctors consult with aged people as well. Like our generation now was saying people have got they expect to be healthy. They they've got Google. They've got plenty of information. Yes. Resources. So doctors often consult with someone um, as if they're an educated patient. Whereas a lot of the elderly, mm. they come from a generation where doctors are God. Yeah. And whatever they tell them to do is they take it. They do it. Yeah. And I, maybe there's not that support either from doctors or nurses when they consult with the aged because they're not getting that information they need anymore and that one-on-one -on -one yep. long consulting time now it's very quick and they oh, yep. you take control. control. And that's a really good point because we talk about patient-centred care mm -hmm. and patient-controlled care and you know some people aren't yeah. equipped to actually take that on in that age group. I know when we were sick, we still had to put on our Sunday clothes to go and see the yeah. doctor because that was respectful. Like no, you'd be, oh my God, I'm dying, you know, yeah. and, and you'd be... They take it and they nod their head and then when they leave, you can tell they're, they're overwhelmed, but they, they don't have that... Um, Not empowered. Like yeah, yeah. Well, my mum's in the situation where she doesn't really like her GP because the GP she was seeing at this practice left. She really doesn't, but I, you know, you know, what if I saw her and I was seeing another doctor and she saw me, that I was there, and I would say, it's your right, Mum, you know, don't, don't keep going there. And I'll give them tips about Dad you doing, I think my dad could get use a podiatrist and he would qualify for a GP management plan. And Mum always goes in with Dad. I'm sure the doctor just goes, oh, rightio. But I said to Mum, remember we talked about that? And she said, oh, yeah, I forgot to ask about that. I don't have a chronic disease. So I'm like, not you, Dad. <laughs> so it is very, and they only tell me little tips as well because they don't want me to, they don't, like you said, they don't want me to know that they're unwell. Like I only found out my Mum was on blood pressure tablets because um, we were at something and Mum was saying, Somebody said, oh, Marg, I heard you fainted at church. And mum said, oh, yeah, I worked out I'd taken two blood pressure tablets instead of one. I'd got up, taken it, and then took it later. And I said to my sister, since when's mum been on blood pressure tablets? We didn't even know that. So um, you can't always assume that the family that's coming in with them have the full story either. So, yeah, so, yeah, so good, good points. Did, were you guys all together? Yeah. What did you say? I went to Zoe's talk that you already said. Yes. Um, in terms of the, um, it's, they just don't have any money and there's no funding around things and the services are really hard to um, get. Even though NDIS is rolling out, it's still taking a oh, an area where... It's a long time, is. isn't it? And to get the NDIS funding, it's really, really hard to do planning and they don't understand. And a lot of people, I've worked with a lot of people with disabilities, and um, there's a lot of family breakdown and, um, and poverty. No money. Mm. Yeah, and you know, the background isn't educated either. Lots yeah. of them. So there's nobody that understands how to yeah. get the services that they need. And the other thing is, like, even getting them to be able to see, be seen by somebody, there isn't people around. Yeah. There's a lot more people coming out now that there's money to see these people, but it's not as easy to access. Access, yeah. They really need a strong advocate. Don't they? And and that's not always no. possible. No. 
and uh, there's so many other health factors around mm. um, like people with disability in terms of like other illnesses and you know obesity yep. and there's, yep. lots, they've just got multiple issues yeah and that's the um the big thing isn't it that we just see the disability and yep. that there is possibly heart disease or yep. uh, depression yep. and all these other things sitting yep. sitting behind that and as they, well they just can't get those services Mm. And I should have said with the Commonwealth that NDIS, that's a really big yeah. scheme that's coming in. And one of the um, big issues that somebody brought up, where was I the other day? And they were saying that one of the big issues is that um, a lot of uh, those services that were provided, um, the state government funded and the state government fund forward. So we would fund for them to work in the next year to achieve all these different things with those particular groups. Whereas the NDIS are paying on completion so some of the people that are the service providers haven't got the cash flow to keep going until they get that payment. And it's not even... ...down now in areas because the mm. is coming. Mm. The NDIS isn't coming. No. So like, you know, behaviour support places are shutting down. The government is shutting them down. People still need those services. Yeah. They still don't have any... Yeah. Because that's happened because the state government don't have the funds. Yeah. So they've had to shut it down. It's, yeah. I'm sure it's not their choice. Um, but yeah, but um, that's a um, people with disabilities are a really big um, area. Um, we're starting a program at the health department on promoting cervical screening for women with disabilities because it's such a big. But it's a very hard to ascertain group because in stats, how do you, we, we don't tick a box to say I have a disability or um, they you know because there's so many levels of disability too. There's um, intellectual to physical. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that was good. What was your other group, just out of interest? The other one was people with strong religious beliefs. I've got a problem where parents feel they don't want their children to get the HPV, the God is all. Yep, uh, as a that is a big issue. Their yep. children's not going to have sex and they're not going to marry someone that has, has had sex. So I do find that... Really yes, I've heard that come up a couple of times. That's mm. great that you're thinking about it. Um, and it is... Um, I was chatting um, to someone. I, I don't chat to everybody. I don't know everything, I promise. It's just it's in an area that I work um, at Cancer Council. And they were saying that, um, we're, particularly now that we're talking about cervical screening, because cervical screening, we're actually looking for HPV. That's what we're testing for, to see if somebody hasn't cleared the virus, they're carrying it. And um, because that will lead, we know, um, it's a much more effective, um, it's going to detect many, many more things than a pap test ever did. But of course, people have been coming in and we've had GPs of different cultures saying, oh, well, you, you were, um, you've only ever slept with one person, had sex with one person, so there's no reason for you now to continue with cervical screening. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a contagious uh, virus that, you know, it's very risky, um, even just d doesn't necessarily pertain to sex. It can be just close touching. Um, and so the difficulty is that um, they don't want to shed, like we know maybe the woman might not have, but how do you know about the man? You know, there's all these risks, but then that means you're sort of saying something about their moral character by pushing that. So it is difficult. When we first started the Gardasil vaccine, I work out at City of Greater Dandenong, we used to put up signs to say, if you think you might be pregnant, please tell the nurse. Um, so the state schools didn't even flinch at that. Um, um, and that we go to a lot of Islamic schools uh, in that area, that's a high population, and they were really weren't happy about having that sign up um, be, because of that reason. And we sort of explained that we really, it's, we don't know if, if someone gets that vaccine and they are, because this was at the stage when we were vaccinating up to year 12. We don't really have them out now for year seven. And, um, but we found it quite funny because the Catholic schools all went, yeah, you better put that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, just the differences. Um, but uh, it, is, it is working through cultural differences. And if it's not the same as yours, because how we've been brought up is how we think mm. things are going to be. And uh, it, yeah, working with that can be very difficult. The best we can do is just inform people with the best information we have and always keep the door open for people to come back if they've got more questions um, and want to want to ask further things. So, yeah, I could talk all day. Have you noticed? Oh, we can all do that. Okay. okay. Mm. <laughs> we just sort of touched a bit more on the diabetics and about how the, the, about the social determinants and the contributing factors. And yep. Yeah, yeah. More on that. Yep. About the, like, just also 
uh, one thing I didn't mention, but is like when you're 18 and you do get your first job, you're on a lower income than what you'll be when you're in your 20s and 30s. Yeah. So it is quite hard as well with that because you could only be on like $400 a week, but that's still too much to get a health care card. Yeah, I know that. It's um, a very hard system to think about. Yeah. Um, it's good that we've all thought, everyone's brought up really good points and all these disadvantaged groups, and it's good um, to be mindful of that. Um, and we, in the space that you're working in, um, you can only work to a certain capacity, but um, being mindful and it's also um, good to chat to your colleagues and, and um, if you're aware of something, because some, sometimes patients can come in regularly and it's like, oh, that person's back again, you know, and sometimes they do keep coming back because, you know, sometimes that's a bit of a social outlet. You might be the only people they might speak to. Jan Rice, who's coming tomorrow, um, to talk about wound care, she's amazing. Um, but she talks about how she, if she's had a long-term ulcer patient, how they actually get, you know, come in and every third day or every week to have their dressing done for a very long time, that she has to start weaning them about six weeks before she thinks they're gonna need, not to need to come because it just becomes so much part of what they do and it's social and, oh, hello, Mrs. Smith, everyone talks to them. And um, so uh, it's um, important to, to um, think about that. And in general practice, that's where we have that continuity of care with patients that we do get to know them as well. So well, well done. Well, and conscientious objectors and that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Discussion Unvaccinated communities are very vulnerable. Um, I say those poor children are disadvantaged. Um, that same sort of thing, I, when we work with conscientious objectors, you're not going to change their mind because they come back with emotional things, look at what they're doing, we'll come back with facts, it's all different. Often the information they're looking at is actually from American websites, uh, not Australian. The one thing um, I always come back with in Australia, none of our childhood vaccines have any mercury in them. We have different brands and what they do in America because some they'll come back with things. Michelle Wills will talk tomorrow about that. She's, um, her and I, she's at Latrobe Immunizer course today, which we um, run together. She's the, she's the supervisor, I'm just the tag along. Um, and um, I forget what I was, where I was going with that. I got off track there. Oh, and we, we always, um, like to say to con people that are con conscientious objectors not to sort of go into bat to bat with them but always have a conversation and sort of say look i've got some information that's you know factual if you want to look at it there's some different things that aren't necessarily from medical organizations the science of immunization and things like that and that always try to leave that door open so that they feel that they can come back like we've got issues with rising meningococcal w well you know that's an devastating disease. If somebody close to them gets that, you can be, bet your bottom dollar they'll be in to get their kids vaccinated, you know. But you don't want that to happen in their lives, something awful, but just always, you don't want them to feel that they can't come back to talk to you. And I'm like that too with people that smoke. I worked for years as an asthma educator. You just, even though you really were like, come on, you know, um, you just have to keep, keep that door open so that when it's time for them, the right time, that you're there to support them as well and I think nurses do that really well and we're often that touch point in general practice that they sort of probably can come in and say oh you know because um, the doctor might not like it whatever when I uh, worked at the Centre for Adolescent Health um, the best thing for talking to young boys was doing lung function together because you weren't didn't have eye contact because you were there with the machine and you'd go so you know do any of your friends smoke as you were as they were stinking of smoke you know oh yeah yeah I go oh you must have been in the car with one of them on the way here you know and they'd sort of slowly admit that yeah and I said look it's good for us to know you've been smoking because we'll keep putting your medications up thinking they're not working and um so you can work around different things that way and they'll go don't tell the doctor <laughs> so, um yeah so the social determinants of health I think you've really got a, a good um sort of concept of that you know with particularly the individual lifestyle factors the um, rural areas and remote areas are, are big things too because we're looking at transport issues as well if they don't have a car. Um, work we did out at Dalesford with um, vulnerable mums, there's quite a few single mums out that area. Of course, the cheaper rental properties are out of town and their bus was only at 8.30 or at 12 o'clock and the immunisation council session was at 10. So, you know, that sort of actually didn't suit because they didn't want to be in town for an hour and 
um, you know, and um, getting getting the later or, or getting the early bus was often difficult as well. And I remember saying that to somebody once, and she was like, "Well, tell them just to get up earlier." It's like, well, that's that's the issues. Often their life's so chaotic they can't. So we've talked about um, uh, what's the, which one's the pointer? There we go. So we've got our hereditary factors, our age and sex that already, uh, you know, have in, have in um, impacts on our health. So getting old is the biggest risk factor of all, but the alternative is not good because if we're not getting old, we're dead. So we've got that one there. And then we've got our individual lifestyle factors. So that's what we, how active we are, what we eat, do we smoke, do we not? Um, and then around that, we've got our social and community networks. And so, you know, that social link into the community and community activity is really, really important, particularly around mental health, our own mental health, like that feeling of connectedness and not feeling isolated. And then it gets into the broader um, picture here. So we've got agriculture, education, work environment. So it's all the living and working conditions, unemployment, water, cleanliness, um, healthcare services and housing all really important sort of basic sort of needs in our life. And that sort of fits around the whole um, environment here. So the general socioeconomic, cultural and environmental conditions is maybe just your local government area, to the state, to the whole country. So work that I used to do out in Dandenong, uh, some of the kids used to bring in <coughs> feeling safe. They'd come from areas that were war torn and you know, being having raided or having to leave quickly or uh, living in concentrate or not concentrate, sorry, um, the, the camps in Pakistan, um, you know, things they felt personally unsafe a lot of the time, whereas in Australia we don't really experience that, generally speaking. Um, and our politics and our government uh, really, you know, we've got a lot of things funded, although as we've talked about with our disadvantaged groups, it's definitely not perfect, but just that they all do impact on, on everybody's individual health. and the health of Australians or people living in Australia on the whole. So our biggest challenges that we've mentioned are our ageing population, our increased rates of chronic illness, um, spiralling costs, as we've talked about, particularly with um, people with disabilities and diabetes, um, inequitable access to healthcare, as we've talked about with our rural and remote um, communities. And like San Remo isn't really that, that far out, but it, there are limited resources because the hospital now is you have to go to one faggy yeah so workforce shortages i think the average age of nurses when they do their census dates is mid to late 50s so we've got a big lot of nurses that are going to be uh, out of the workforce in the next couple of decades so thank goodness there's a few young faces in here coming up and then we've also as somebody mentioned increased consumer expectations and demand someone said you know people come in already informed or i think we were talking in relation to aged people that maybe they're not so we we can come in and demand a lot more people seem to know their rights and what they can do as well so all of these things um, can be very challenging um, to work with um, of course the aging population does lead to increased rates of chronic illness because that's just what's going to happen as we get older as well Experience. Yes. How do you get it if you don't get a job? If you don't get a job, that's right. I'm, the amount of places I applied to, and they said, have you worked in for general practice before? I said, no, no, I haven't. I want to start. And they went, oh, no, no, no. We don't We don't even look at people who haven't had at least five years experience. So oh, I'm yes, like, oh, it makes it hard. How do I do that? Yeah. They were the only ones that took me on with the general practice because I went to hospitals in Yarram, Stale, Tarelg and Bansdale, which is like, mind you, over an hour travelling in all directions. And no one was hiring, yeah. and no one would take me because I had no hospitals. experience. That's what I'm saying. You can't actually get yeah. experience yeah. until yeah. you get employment. And that's because us older chicks aren't leaving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, also, I don't mean it like that. And also, I think because we've got so many, um, like everyone that actually pays to get an education should have a job at the end of it. Yeah. Because you're paying for it. Yeah. So I think it's the government's responsibility yeah. to make sure that there are positions for yeah. all that, or everyone that comes out, because otherwise you've got this huge hex set or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and if you also speak to people right. around the hospital system. A friend of mine's got a husband in at um, rehab. He had a he uh, actually fell at home and landed on an ottoman like this and fractured two three. So he's considered a quadriplegic. Um, 
and um, she said at the rehabilitation place, so they're all sort of, he's moved from Austin to there and getting ready to come home. He has got some movement back in three of his limbs. And, um, but she said, they're always short staffed. They're always running, they're, you know, it's always that somebody, and they can't get somebody to fill in or they, they can't because they've met their quota on spending this month. And so I think, and if you go into hospitals and uh, that as well, often that's the thing. It's just that there's just not enough people around, whereas we've got the staff that could do it, but it's just once again, coming back to all the funding because it all comes back to the bottom dollar. Um, so um, that, that is a real issue. And I guess we can speak to APNA how they can um, push up to the government for that. <laughs> um, because that, that, that you're right, it is a real issue. And I think too that the fact that a lot of uh, nurses graduating can't get a grad year because that grad year consolidates everything. Whether, and you know, we need to look at maybe grad years in primary care like rather than doing your three different wards in hospitals, maybe. So we need to be a bit more creative in what we can, can do for that. And I think engineering's a good point. There's, most of our engineering jobs are overseas now and there's still thousands of kids at uni doing engineering, you know, like you said, big hex debts and no jobs. And I think there is a moral obligation, but that's my bandstand done for there as well. So our national health priorities, so this is what the Commonwealth Government are funding, will, will be offering, have been offering extra funding for, um, for our national pri um, priorities. So that cardiovascular disease is still our number one, it's our number one killer. Cancer, diabetes, and generally when we talk about diabetes there, we're talking about type two diabetes. Um, mental health disorders, injury prevention and control. Dementia, asthma, I don't know why the one's there. Asthma one arthritis and musculoskeletal disease and obesity. Some of those all intertwine with each other, like cardiovascular disease can lead to cancer, can lead to diabetes. You know, having poor mental health can lead to these things as well because we're not activated to do things to, to help ourselves as well. Um, mental health disorders, I think uh, as we, the same thing we said um, with people with disabilities, often that's all we see, oh, the person with schizophrenia, the depression, and they have got other often, you know, comorbidities with that because of the medications or things that they've been on. Um, so they are all risks. Um, most of us um, will have quite a good quality of life, or we'll, even though we're living older, we still do have quite a good quality of life, but I think it's two thirds of people as we get older will be living with um, mus arthritis, musculoskeletal disease, which will really impact on our quality of life as we get older. So each decade older we get, um, this, this is sort of the one that's, um, I guess, uh, difficult to treat in the, and it's often pain, it's often dealing with controlling pain because we're often those things we can't actually cure. Um, and whereas your cardiovascular disease doesn't ev cause you pain every day necessarily, if it's causing you pain, you should be in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. But arthritis and musculoskeletal disease is sort of those, those hidden ones that um, can really impact on people's lives as well. Now we have primary health networks. Has, do people know who, have you heard of primary health networks before? Yeah, have, do you know who you, your contact is in your primary health network? Has, has everyone had contact with their primary health network that's working in general practice? That's great. Um, so the PHNs, as they're called, have priorities to, um, to work in these different um, workforces here. Um, so they've been given uh, money to work in their areas and they've been um, meant to be mapping their population and the demographics of what in their specific area are their greatest needs and what they should be focusing on and working on. Um, there's still a new iteration at the moment. They're only two and a half years old. So years and years ago, we had divisions of general practice, which Belinda and I worked in. Um, and then they were sort of little, um, sort of, we had um, 29 of them in Victoria. Then they went to Medicare locals and we had 17 of them. And now we've got six PHNs. So they've become bigger beasts and they're much bigger now. And they really, if you were there in the days of divisions and Medicare locals, they do, really do operate in a very different way now. Most of them still have a practice engagement arm or a general practice engagement arm where they will provide some support and resources for general practice because that really is their main area of work because our main area of primary care provision in Australia is through general practice. Although we have, do have other things like our um, 
community health services and that as well. But generally speaking, um, general practice is the most common primary care space. And I think over 90% of us will visit our GP at least once a year or so annually. So you've got the biggest audience of everybody that's out there in your community. So primary health care is essential health based on practical, scientifically sound and socially acceptable methods and technology made universally acceptable to individuals and families in the community through their full participation. This is the longest sentence I've ever read in my life. So that's um, all from the Alma Arda there that we talked about earlier from 1978. So. Um, so in the community through their full participation and at a cost that the community and country can afford to maintain at every stage of their development in the spirit of self-reliance and self-determination. Self-determination has become a, an, uh, a thing, particularly in Victoria, for our Aboriginal people. Um, it was passed last year by the state government that um, so self-determination um, is for Aboriginal communities to decide uh, what they need what, what services and how those needs might be met. There's still a bit of guiding going on with that, um, but that's uh, something you might hear a bit about self-determination, because we had that, that was passed last year with our new Aboriginal policies. We had the, so, um, the injecting room passed and we had end of life decision-making passed as well. So Victoria moved ahead quite markedly last year with quite forward thinking um, strategies. It forms an integral part of both of the country's health system, of which it is the nucleus and the overall social and economic development of the community. So what that's saying is that often the health of that country is dependent on more than just the healthcare system. It's political stability, it's the, the um, society and um, uh, sociology behind it all as well. So people that were... 40 years old. It is. And we're still not where we need to be. They wanted it, we wanted to have health for all by the year 2000 or something, and we're still not there. <laughs> so only 18 years late. So, um, so it's the model for development of health for individuals and communities. Primary health care is the key strategy to deal with the social determinants of health and reduce their um, health inequities. So that, that's, um, that one there is more of a health promotion strategy as well. So primary health care services, the provision of healthcare outside the tertiary setting, so the hospital setting. So we have GP practices specialists, radiology, pathology, community health, allied health practitioners, community mental health services, uh, non-government organisations and not-for-profit services. So you're looking at your Heart Foundation, Diabetes uh, Association, um, other support services. I worked for an organisation called Networking Health Victoria. Um, so that though is sort of all not for profit and there's home care and social support services as well. We used to have hack services, um, home and community care, which was funded through the local government system. That's now a lot of that is under the umbrella of my aged care. But for anyone under 65, that is still available through local government as well. So the general practice environment. So oh, I said 90, 85% of the population will visit a GP. General practice is the most frequent point of entry into the healthcare system. That goes from single solo GPs right through to multidisciplinary teams. Um, and as they've said there, there's super clinics, there's remote, there's rural, there's regional. We even have, you know, over the internet healthcare now in for some areas as well. Um, we have GP services are available per session provided through flexible appointment scheduling. After hour service pathway, which I think still under um, it's been reviewed and some new um, things are coming in around aftercare services as well, um, which hopefully we'll know more about as time goes on because the government were reviewing that because it was costing them a fortune. So it's all about best patient care. Sorry, 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 I got that wrong. <laughs> Often at the end of the day, it is value for money. Um, and But they were finding there was a lot of um, misuse of the billing items, should we say. Um, and provision of comprehensive holistic patient care so the general practice, and it's, I don't mean just GPs or whatever, it's the whole practice, is sort of the, the central point for that patient. Sort of They can be like the care coordinator, if you like. Because if you think about it, we need to see the GP to get a referral to a specialist, let us go back to the GP. So everything should come back to that central point. And when we have our e-health records, woohoo, up and running, it should all work really smoothly because we've only spent billions of dollars on it for about a decade to get it up to speed. So 
there are our general practice teams, which I'm sure you're um, more than aware of. We have our own practice manager sitting down here. They can make or break the practice. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Um, well, there you go. That's good, though. Um, I, I sort of see a good model would be for every GP, there's six practice nurses, because I think the nurses can do, do a lot of, lot of things. But that's just me. I'm not biased at all. Um, working in prevention in primary care, general practice provides preventive care that uh, proactively targets high-risk individuals who may be least likely to seek out such care. Now, this can be really difficult because uh, some days you'll probably be just so, your appointment books will be so full, you've got enough bums on seats that you're just, you know, getting through the day. So it's really good to maybe sit back and think about what could you do. So you, a lot of you might um, look at recalls and reminders, maybe say around flu vaccine. When you're getting to this time of the year when the flu vax is going to come out, or you're over 65s, you might um, do a, a search for that on your software and maybe send out reminders to say, hey, remember it's flu season. Um, some of you might be working on your doing health assessments for your over 75. So you might have that in your system that they're automatically sent a reminder when they're due or you get notified when they're actually due so that um, you know you, they can be on their annual rotating roster. I look after these old guys. They live in a community, they're religious brothers and they all have their health assessments. They're only, they sort of are staggered over time. So they sort of start in about February and the first one that goes always comes back and goes, You've got to spell world backward this year because, you know, they, they know which one it is. And then one of them will write down what the items are that you're going to say. And so, so they've already learnt them. So it's actually their long term memory rather than their short term memory. And they'll go, oh, they said to count backwards by seven. And so they all start practicing. Because <laughs> their long term memory is amazing. They can tell you what happened in 1946, but what they had for breakfast this morning, no way. So, um, so, um, so there's lots of ways um, as nurses and uh, or practice managers can actually you can sort of get a bit more control over the patients coming through because particularly patients with chronic disease if you're reviewing them on a regular cycle um, or you know keeping them up to date with their scripts and everything it doesn't become that urgent I need an appointment today sort of thing so that they've already got appointments booked in so you can sort of manage your workflow a bit better and there will always be urgent things and people that need to make appointments quickly but you can sort of manage that sort of uh, known you know you know that workload's coming so you can actually control that as well and you can sort of um, talk to people that you might do a search on your software for people that have um, all been prescribed diabetic medications or you know you could think about something else so maybe you could do other activities with them that could um, you could coordinate their care as well so there's a lot lot you can do mary this afternoon talks a lot more around um, dealing with chronic disease so health promotion health promotion is a big beast in itself and we look at health promotion at a political level where we have to change laws right down to people actually looking after people or maybe doing health education. The main thing with health promotion is that we want to empower people, enable people to actually take control of their health care um, and uh, be that sort of self-driver in, in that system. It doesn't necessarily work for everyone, as we've said, for some of the people, older people in our community. But when we're saying enabling them and engaging them to do that, we need to have everything around them set so that they can do that as well. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to uh, ride my bike to work every day. Mind you, I always ride on the footpath because I don't like being on the roads. But if there's no bike paths that are safe, that sort of impedes that. Or no playgrounds for kids to go and play. So it's not just what you can do at general practice. It's what we can promote throughout the community as well. And sometimes it is like a walkout in schools in America to sort of, you know, ban the gun, which I can't believe they're still not doing that over there. Um, so health care, health promotion in primary care. So the component that primary care can do with health promotion is um, looking at prevention, early intervention, fo focusing on keeping well. And that's what a lot of our screening programs about, like cervical screening and bowel screening. We're screening people before they've had cancer. We're looking for the indicators that might lead to cancer and we can do something about it. So, you know, if they've got a polyp that's bleeding, have a colonoscopy, get the polyp removed, and then it never moves on to cancer. So if you look at our 
cervical cancer rates, they're very low, but we've treated a lot of women for the, you know, the pre-existing factors with that. Breast cancer is a little bit different with our breast screen. We're actually looking to find cancer at an early stage. So we, can't, we haven't got to the stage where we can look to see what, what's the early signs, but that's also giving people a better outcome because we're finding it early, um, they're going to live longer. Uh, looking at the determinants of health, that can be very difficult in your uh, space too because often determinants of health, once we get to age and uh, race we can't, and gender, we can't often change, change those things. But they're things that you can talk to them about, exercising, uh, just even saying to them increasing the amount of water they drink. Uh, they're simple, you can do from simple things right up to really you know, high powered. Um, and you can be advocates for change. Some people have had some really good suggestions for nursing and that here already. Preventive activities in general practice. Have you all done an OSD risk score on your risk of developing type 2 diabetes? That's a really exciting one to do. <laughs> it's more for people that are, are, are getting closer to the age of 50 or if they're in their 40s. And you can get a score that looks at um, their different risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes because that, that's one of our biggest, uh, one of our big uh, illness groups, cardiovascular. And a lot of those risks for cardiovascular and diabetes are the same as well. Um, and having records of um, family history, uh, chatting to people about their stress levels um, and looking at risk factor identification and harm minimisation. So if somebody's come in because they've got a sore throat or something and you know they sort of may, might seem a little bit drug affected or you know got obvious signs of it it might you might want to start a conversation with them and if you're sort of looking at that in a non-judgmental way um, they might feel that they can come back to you and know that you're not going to make changes at every single appointment that it can, it's a long road sometimes um, health coaching immunization is all good um, there's um, our different ways we can, um, the practice is funded. You probably know all those. So the medical home is a new model here and we've got a trial happening at the moment in South East Melbourne PHN. So in the South Eastern suburbs, there's 20 practices that have signed up to trial out this, the, the Commonwealth Government are trialling healthcare homes or medical homes. Um, and so people with um, two or three uh, chronic diseases, or I think it's three or four chronic diseases, um, are registered to that practice and registered and the practice gets a lump sum for that year to care for that patient. So they can come and go and planning, planning their, their care that way. And that's a model that they're looking at to roll out across the country so that anybody with sort of extensive uh, chronic disease profiles um, would be, have to register with a practice so that um, their, all of their care for that disease uh, would be dealt with at that practice. Um, having said that, if they go on holidays and need to see somebody because they need stitches or something acute, that's okay because that's not actually in that funding model. That funding model is for that chronic disease, their chronic diseases as well. But you'll start to hear more about that as because they're talking about it being a trial and then all of a sudden they're calling it a rollout. So that means in the next few years it's going to be probably rolled out. Disease, um, yeah. So like diabetes and diabetes. hypertension and they can't go on uh, holidays for another. Oh no, they can. The time or yeah. Like oh no, they could. They just need to plan it so that they could speak to their GP and say we're going to Italy for six weeks. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so then they would maybe organise their scripts or whatever, and then talk about how they could coordinate their care. Um, yeah. So they're not going to be. And another one comes to chronic pain then. Yep. They'll, they'll have definitions of what, what clients fit into the, the funding model. So they're fairly, uh, they're fairly descriptive at the moment. Yeah, so yeah. So, um, so as you all know, we have Medicare uh, for most of us, as we've talked about, somebody mentioned about um, <coughs> clients that don't have Medicare and that, that is an issue in itself, just having to self-fund, particularly if um, you're, um, you don't have the capacity to have, get earn an income or um, have social services as well. Um, a lot of data is taken from the Medicare system because that's sort of seen like, so anyone that gets their bowel screening kit is taken from the Medicare database. 
So a lot, of, a lot of our population health stuff is based on Medicare registration. So once again, there's whole groups that miss out on any sort of assessment of, of our healthcare system or, or when we're looking at um, ages and diseases or places of birth as well. Um, Department of Veteran Affairs as well. I think everybody wants to try and get that gold card because that provides the most funding. So there's different coloured cards with Veterans Affairs and that will depend on different levels of funding. So people with the gold card can get aged care and all of that funded by the government. Um, and there's different levels for everyone else. I'm not as au fait with the different levels, but that's easily looked up if you just go to the Department of Veteran Affairs website. But I think these gold cards are becoming fewer and fewer. Um, we also have practice incentive programs um, as well. Um, so practices that are accredited um, qualify to get practice incentives. So um, that's looking at, um, I think, is it on the next slide? Yes. So we've got um, PIP, PIP payments for these different things here as well. Some of these um, PIP uh, things were going to change. Well, let me see. Did we go to that? Oh, it was in my notes. Let me see. Um, there, and now it's been delayed for 12 months. So there was going to be changes at the end of April yeah. this year to come in in May this year for changes for cervical screening, diabetes and asthma, I think it was. Um, they've now, that's now been delayed a year. So any of the incentives you've been getting for those things will can now continue for another 12 months as well. Um, so there's all those um, different incentives that practices can get and it's based on the amount of the a number of patients at your clinic. They, the government calculate that. But that's extra income. So that's an incentive for you to call in all your women that are due for their cervical screens or um, you know, do your asthma care plans or your aged care assessments. And um, so they, that you can get extra funding that way. And I would always, as a nurse, keep a record of how many health assessments and things I've done and then at least ask for them to provide champagne at the Christmas party based on what you've brought into the practice. Okay. We have a PNIP program as well, which is a practice nurse incentive program that started in 2012. And so for reg accredited practices, they can get this much money a year per registered nurse, 25,000 and 12,500 for an enrolled nurse working a minimum of 12.6 hours a week. Um, and that's capped at 125,000. But that's for them employing a nurse. And that's so that nurses are given that um, ability to work across the practice. We used to have item numbers for nurses, wound care, immunisation and a couple of others, but it locked them into only doing that because it was seen as a really good funding source and so, oh, we'll just get the nurse to do this. Whereas registered nurses, enrolled nurses have really good skills. You know, we've got more skills than just that. So that's why this came in, so that you can assist with a lot. So health assessments, the nurses can do a lot of that data collection and um, deciding whether they need to see the GP or not um, and um, working out care plans as well. And that's bread and butter for a lot of practices now. So this is around the healthcare homes. So this is in your notes. So unless you're in the southeastern area at the moment, you're in Dandenong, so that'll be your area, Dan. Um, but not every practice is in it. So just be aware that this is going to be rolled out. The primary health networks will keep you informed or will ask to see if you want to sign up for it as well. There'll be education and that around it. Um, there's a lot of uh, controversy around it because some practices don't feel that it really covers every expense. Others think it might be okay. So it's going to be interesting to see how they evaluate it and what comes out of that. So that, that will be the future. And if you think about how healthcare is run in Britain and in New Zealand, they work on this sort of model where they look at what their patient demographic is and they're funded uh, per demographic. So um, New Zealand look at uh, age, you know, if you've got a lot of people that are aged, you get a certain amount of money if they're over a certain age. Anyone with diabetes, you get this much, anyone with this. So it's worked out that way. And some people are really great promoters of it and others are like, mm, not so sure. But it, um, we're getting a hybrid version of that. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, so these are some goals you might want to set for your practice uh, in looking at um, uh, increasing uh, preventive healthcare approaches, so looking at health promotion as well. Um, we also have the red and green books, which the RACGP put out. So they've got 
health promotion activities, um, prevention activities and chronic disease activities. And they also have the SNAP guidelines. So SNAP is, I always get stuck on one, smoking, nutrition, activity or alcohol and physical activity. So SNAP, you'll, you'll hear that. I think Mary will talk about that again as well. Okay, so just thinking about, um, just before we finish, um, if you want to think about health promotion as a whole community thing, down to nurses working with patients to quit and, ass and assisting them with quitting, right through to our government policies. So our first change or the first quit campaign commenced in Australia in 1977. And it's taken us to 2018 to get where we are now. And there was outcry when some of these things came in, when they started restricting where people could smoke and you know, putting taxes on cigarettes. And we, I think the first thing they did was hike up cigarette prices. And with the money that we received in Victoria from the taxes that were put onto cigarettes, they formed Vic Health, which was one of the first health promotion um, NGO, non-government organisation ever to be formed in the world. And they still exist now, they're in Carlton. And a lot of their activity and promotion is around all of those sort of health promoting lifestyles. They advocate, advocate to government for policy change, right down to resources and things for consumers. So can you, anyone remember the Life Be In It campaigns and things, and Life Be In It was a physical activity campaign. It was this guy called Norm, he had his beer belly sat in front of the telly and it was to get him active and moving. And so um, a lot of our smoke, a cigarette tax still goes to help fund Vic Health. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword because if too many people stop smoking, we don't have our tax. But I'm sure the government will keep paying that. But like it's um, <coughs> quite interesting that they've never actually made it illegal when we know it's such a harmful product. Like it's the one thing we really can't do in moderation. It's, it's harmful regardless. But it's taken that many years, like 40 years of advocating for people to stop smoking. And we've known for a long time that it is bad, like well and truly we know it is. Um, that um, just to think about your, you're a cog in the wheel of that whole health promotion that all the, the campaigning and legislation changes might get, land somebody at your practice um, needing advice on how to quit and support for that. Um, other things that we've in health promotion that we've had are like our TAC campaigns. We don't think of that necessarily as in regard to health, but you know, one year we had so many really awful car accidents. Our road toll was so high that they started all of those campaigns. We've had lots of variations um, to quite sort of, you know, quite violent looking ads right through to sort of maybe not so um, sort of exposing us so much to trauma. Um, but that's all health promotion and that starts with, you know, people advocating for policy change. And often it's because of the result of something happening that we, you know, this, too many of this is happening. Work care is another thing that's happened. Too many accidents and deaths in workplaces. So they've legislated. When you think about a lot of the changes around health care that's happened is because we've actually advocated enough to get legislation changes. So then it becomes the law. So then people have to abide by it. So that just in if that thought process for you. Does anyone have any questions or anything they want to ask?